This is the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we teach you the proven methods to grow your seven-figure business to 10 million and beyond. Please welcome your host, Brett Gilliland. Welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we are always bringing in guests who have unique insights into the seven-figure growth journey. Those of you who have made it to that million-dollar mark and have a growing team, you know how challenging it can be as the business starts to outgrow your, your own personal capacity to hold it all together. And so we bring in people like you who've gone through some of those changes and share some of their lessons learned. So I want to introduce to you our guest today. His name is Robbie Kowal. Robbie has been a force in the business of music since the 1990s. He's been a musician, a producer, a creative director, and an innovator in the use of audio technology to solve real world challenges. As we get into learning more about his business, which is called Hush Concerts, you'll find that they do something super innovative, and I'm excited to have him share that. And then we'll get into some of the some of the lessons that he's learned as a business owner. But let me tell you a little bit more about Robbie. He was a prolific touring DJ in the early 2000s. He was asked in 2005 by Bonnaroo Music and Arts Festival to play the US's first silent disco, which I think is really interesting. And and I think must have been the path to this Hush Concerts idea. So let's have you, Robbie. Let me welcome you, Robbie. Thank you for being here, first of all. Great to be here, thank you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Hush Concerts and, and what must what I'm assuming is the path from that first silent disco to what Hush Concerts represents today, what you guys are doing? Yeah, I think a lot of people uh, consider that they've had moments in their life where, they're, where they look back and they say, wow, it was all meant to be because I was there at that time. I was very fortunate. And uh, I was simultaneous while all these different things were going on. I was a concert promoter in San Francisco. My company, Sunset Promotions, was producing a jazz festival, and we were in a battle with the city with a group of angry NIMBY neighbors who wanted to shut down this free jazz festival, and they were using noise as the um, as the impetus to, to uh, get us to shut the event down. And at the same time, I was at Bonnaroo playing uh, DJing at the festival when they brought Silent Disco to America. And obviously, I put two and two together. Hey, headphones with no loudspeakers can solve problems for folks like us. Now, we didn't end up solving that problem with headphones there, but it immediately made me realize that there were dozens and hundreds. And subsequently, I've met thousands of people who are having challenges with angry neighbors around audio and anger by the way nice neighbors who are having challenges with people who are making too much noise around them right it's not always the angry neighbor this is we're all in this thing together right and so the headphones were just they're just one of the ways that we relaunched our company hush concerts as a way to help people solve these problems and um it's been you know, wow, we've been in business for over for two decades, but really focused on the headphone side of the business and the, you know, we, uh, the sound mitigation event audio challenge solving problem solving side of the business for about a decade now. And uh, I can't even tell you how many people we've helped and how much fun we've had along the way. Well, it's a fascinating business. Uh, before we get into some of your lessons learned as a leader in that business. Well, I would love to, I mean, just just give people as, uh, I guess, as vivid a description as you can about what it's like to be at a silent, a silent music event, a silent concert. What does that look like? What happens to make that possible? Sure. So, I mean, the fascinating thing is that the headphones are just a tool and you can use them for concerts. They're most traditionally known as silent disco. And usually when you think of a silent disco, there would be like three DJs on stage and you're out in the audience uh, dancing to three different types of music, or you could switch your headphones from this DJ is playing that to that DJ is playing that to this DJ is playing the other thing. So it solves a, a you know you think about like the wedding where the 
the parents don't like what the kids are playing and the kids don't like what the parents are playing solves that problem instantly. And so at a, in a lot of our concert settings, we will program and curate up to five different streams of music, sometimes as many as five live performers at a time. At one festival that I, I do the curation and booking for, I can have up to 30 people on stage in the course of an evening. And it's a lot of work and it's outrageous, but the musical experience for an attendee is uh, it's eye opening. What's really cool, though, also just to walk by and you hear all these people dancing and talking, and enjoying themselves, and they're they're losing their minds in this false anonymity of bliss. But you don't hear the music. And so you have to go. You have to go check it out. And then if you stand in the line as we're passing on the headphones, as people are walking in, the second they put them on huge smile on their face. So that's Hush Concerts. That's one whole side of our business. And then we have this whole other corporate product called Silent Conference. And we're doing a similar kind of thing with the headphones, but it's at trade shows and corporate meetings. And a good example, I was just down in Panama where we, we were, they were doing two track sessions in the same ballroom at the same time. And they had four people on, on stage speaking three languages in these panel discussions. And we had translators translating Spanish to blue, English to green, Portuguese to yellow. And then the, the, um, the, the main feed was not only on the loudspeakers, but also in your headphones. Um, and we had the translators and we had to coordinate it all. So we had eight channels of RF going out with 1200 headphones in a foreign country and um, it was, again, kind of an enormously complicated challenge, but that's an example of the kind of thing we can do on the corporate side, right? Um, we've done 35 rooms at Moscone Center for Oracle. We've done, you know, 10,000 headphones at a concert. It really has been a fascinating experience to, to help turn that, that initial DJ experience into a whole world of solutions for, for folks that need it. Yeah, it's fascinating to me. I've I could just sit here and listen to all the examples you're sharing for a long time, but let's transition to sure. now. Um, so, so like many of the business owners that I get to talk to, you have a craft, you, you're a master at a certain thing. And, and that was music and music production for a long time. And now yeah. it's, it's AV that supports that, that world, but you also are a business owner. Yeah. And as you're trying to grow your business, you've had to learn some things about how to grow the business that's just different. It's not more complicated necessarily, but just different than the craft that you've honed for so many years. Now you're trying to figure out how to do this business building work. So let's let's talk about some of the challenges that you've had in, in doing this work and, and bringing the business as far as you have. What are some of the, I don't know, what are some of the standout challenges that you've faced as you've tried to grow this business? Woo, I mean, where to begin? Right. You know, we really did do it the hard way. We were bootstrapped from the beginning. And in as promoters, we were in the, the you know, essentially professional gamblers, uh, betting on bands, betting on shows, betting on events, and sometimes walking away, not only with not having made money for all our work, but having lost money. I lost I lost six figures on a show twice and not having, you know, a live nation behind us. Uh, once we transitioned to a more stable model of where we were essentially a vendor, we were getting hired by concert promoters and, and conference producers, it's, it stabilized our business model quite a bit. But then the challenge becomes a lot of the same kind of things that every other entrepreneur has to do, right? You're, you have to hire a sales team. You have to, you have to hone and hire a marketing team. You have to think about HR. We had to write our first employee handbook, all of these sort of things. And back in 2016, we had our first investor, this incredible angel investor who's still with us, still my partner. I had a business partner as well for all that time until about three years ago. And we were 50-50 partners. And talk about a real challenge. One of the challenges is um, even though we're still the best of friends, we grew up through this business like brothers. When you're a 50-50 partnership, it's really hard to make a, a hard decision sometimes, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and we would have to really marinate on these things back and forth. And so it really slowed us down sometimes. And, um, and so that was a big challenge. And uh, John, who I, I 
cannot tell you how much I still love that gentleman. Um, started it in a different kind of company, left a few years ago. And so then the challenge became, wow, I'm it. I'm in charge. Am I ready? How do you become the guy? What is the CEO? How do you? And so I did everything I could to learn. I crash coursed it. And even with that, every day is, you know, a new thing I, I could never have expected and a new challenge. And, you know, one of the great things about having that partner all those years was I never had to worry about staying motivated because if I slacked off, he let me know and vice versa. Now it's, now it's, you know, there's only one person at the top and you have to, you have to really push yourself to keep your head in the game. It's, it's, uh, I guess that would be a big challenge. Be, you know, being alone in, at, at the top is is a challenge as well. Well, we, we didn't talk about that at all before the show, Robbie. But I but I think that that's a prevalent enough reality for many of of the folks in this seven figure space that I'd like to spend just a minute longer on that, if you don't mind. Why sure. don't you Why don't you speak to how you how do you stay well? Like you personally stay well when you're carrying that full weight. I mean, it's one thing when 50-50 and the, and the decision making might have been a little trickier, but at least there was somebody else helping you to carry it. Now, I mean, you can make quicker decisions, but the full weight is on you. And how do you stay motivated? How do you keep yourself in the game mentally, emotionally, even physically, if you want to touch on that, when when so much is on on you? So staying positive about the business now isn't that hard because of what we went through in the pandemic. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about it when it was hard. <laughs> well, I'm just saying like, you know, there if, if you're in the event industry and there are no events, there is no industry. So there were there was a moment where we had to come to Jesus as a company. We're like, are we looking at bankruptcy or are we going to try to fight through this? And we found a way to fight through it. And we all took unemployment and, you know, it turns and we but what's amazing is throughout that entire experience. Nobody left. The entire we kept the entire team together. We made sure everybody was taken care of, and we transformed the company from what was a group of people that worked together into what I think of really, uh, without any hyperbole, as my family. The you know we're a small team. We always have been, but that hard road really transformed us into a family. And we have family squabbles, like any family would, right? Mm -hmm. But. And there are times when you could say that I might be better off hiring a different CEO and stepping aside, or that there are people in my company who probably, I could probably find maybe somebody better to do their specific job, but I wouldn't think of it because they, we are a family now. And, um, and I think if anything helps me survive and, and mentally um, overcome the, any doubts or any motivations, it, any time I have to do that, I can call up one of them and say, hey, I'm having trouble with this. What do you think? Now, I'm not asking that, you know, I, I, there's no mask of command in our company either. Like, no, everybody knows I'm the first one to admit my mistakes. I'm the first one I want to teach people. Humility and accountability is incredibly important in our organization. It's all about learning. It's all about teaching, right? And, um, but keeping keeping positive, keeping motivated, all I need to do is think back to three years ago. And had I known that we would still be thriving today, you know, three years ago, I would have cried in happiness, right? So we're already we're already playing with house money. I think that's yeah. yeah. Look at. Nothing like nothing like a little contrast, right? Three years ago, it was so it probably seemed so impossible, so dark that. Now it's like, oh, piece of cake, even though you still have challenges, you still have squabbles, you still have all the stuff. But looking back, it's it's way better now than than it was. So I can appreciate that. It's a whole uh, bag of new challenges, right? Yeah, that's but, right. But, but we're still here. Well, and and you didn't use these words specifically, but being in the trenches with people and coming out of that, coming the other side of that really mm -hmm. brings people together in a way that that it's hard to replicate in like normal circumstances, right? So the fact that you guys went through what you did and came out of it and you're all still together, that's, that's remarkable, really. If I have 
a degree of professional pride. It's in the loyalty I feel from the folks that are with us. Like the just, I don't know that they all like me. And I know they make fun of me sometimes, right? Which is fine. Mm -hmm. And I'm, we all, you know, but they're all in this thing. They view this, they're all, we're all part of the same mission and they're all in it for the right reasons. And, and God bless them. Yeah, I, I would I would love to have you unpack that a little bit further, Robbie. When you say they're all in, you talk about the loyalty. I mean, you, yeah. you have this sense of professional pride or accomplishment around having created that level of connectedness with these people. Yeah. I don't imagine that you're paying them twice the market rate, right? And no. you talked about the power <laughs> of mission. You use that word. I'd, I'd like to get underneath that a little bit more and just say, how have you created a team that's so connected, so united, so loyal? Like, how's that happen? Man, it's not easy. Um, and it hasn't always been smooth. And it always, you know, it's part of it is like this group of people, but we've also had groups of people that have had trouble in the past as well. But um, I will say this, um, part of my experience in the music business was that we were always underfunded. We were always the bootstrap little promoter and we were always up against the live nations of the world. So we had to do things cheaper and faster. And um, we were using volunteers all the time to build events. And managing volunteers is very different from managing employees. Volunteers are there because they want to be. And the second they feel like you're bossing them around or treating them like, you know, you have to do this because I'm paying you, uh, they're going to leave. And so I had to learn how to lead volunteers, how to inspire volunteers rather than employing volunteers and tasking people, right? And, and sometimes it was about showing them that I was willing to glue the cardboard together for the art behind the stage, or I was willing to clear the, the dishes in the hospitality room or the green room, or I was willing to move barricades or portalettes with my own toil. And sometimes I was the only one out there doing it, or John and I, my former partner, right? Um, that inspires people to get involved. And if you have that spirit of service, that spirit of sharing, and also came out of years of waiting tables and bartending from when I was younger, if you have that spirit of service and teamwork um, instilled in you, humility, accountability, it's a lot easier to get other people to buy in. If you're the one out there moving barricades, if you're the first one out there moving barricades, everyone's going to jump in. If they see that the CEO of the company is getting there before everybody else and leaving after everybody else. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean that sometimes I'm not at events and say, hey guys, I'm bushed. I need to get home to my family. Can you guys close this out? They're fine with it. But if I detect that, like, actually, you know, there are other times when people are sick, they have to go home. I'll stay late. Like, that's, I think that's what it comes down to. It's, it's creating a, a system of humility and accountability and honesty, right? That's how you do that. And when the pandemic hit, when it was really dark, I didn't BS anyone. I was very clear. I said, hey, I don't know if we're going to have a company in two months, but here's what we're going to try. Are you guys down? Are you in with this? Do you have better ideas? Has anybody heard anything? And every week during those me weekly meetings, when we were checking in, how's everybody doing? Um, whose mortgage needs to be paid? Whose rent needs to be paid? Who's most in need right now? We will take care of them first, right? We, including me, I was foregoing income, foregoing whatever to keep them whole as best I could. And, and by the way, like it wasn't always perfect, right? I'm sure I made mistakes. I'm sure we made mistakes, but we put all of us on the same plane at that time. And I really have worked very hard not to lose that. There have been a few times when I've had to say, hey, I need you to go do this. I know you don't want to do this, but I need you to do this. But it's never been like, you know, that's what I'm paying you for. Like, that's not how we speak. That's not how we work. And in general, most of the people who work for me, I would say they're here because they're not motivated by money. You know, we don't, we don't pay um, what most technology companies, we pay a, a pretty solid production company rate for day rates and stuff, I've worked really hard to get those rates up. In fact, I think one of the things people really appreciated was that, you know, in, in music production, in vendor world, in concerts and conferences and stuff, 
very, I would say a third of the people you meet are on salary. Most of the people are working day rates on gigs. I've worked very hard to get our day rates up to a competitive level with the rest of the, the corporate side of our industry. And, and I think that's been appreciated too. So I guess that'd be one way to do it. Well, it, it sounds like there were several things that you said. I, I want to highlight a few Please. Uh, just because I, I'm learning here as you, as you speak, as you share. Um, there was, there was a, an important element around you not being too good to jump in and be part of the solution as far as not, not with the ideas, but like with the actual chipping in. Like I, yeah. I'm going to have a, I'm going to approach this with a servant's heart. I'm going to get in and just be humble and serve. The, that speaks volumes to your people who are looking to your example as much or as more than to what you say, right? It's not just about what you say, but it's, it's what you're doing. And they're, they're watching you be completely connected to and completely connect, committed to, to getting this done together. Yeah. I heard you use the word we a ton. Like, it sounds like we, 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 we all over the place in your, in your business instead of I and you. And there's this togetherness thing that you speak just, just naturally. I think that's important. I'd, I'd actually love to hear you say anything you can think of. It, it may be so natural for you that you don't even know what you're doing, but is there, what are some of the things aside from you jumping in and participating in getting work done? What are some other things that you've done to try to foster that sense of we, that we're, this is flat here. We're, no one's better than anybody else. And we're all in this together. What are some things you've done to create that? Well, one thing we did, um, we had a retreat a couple of years ago, which we'd never done. And we got everybody that we could together um, out at a, this place out in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And we did some traditional retreat type stuff. And it, that was really important because we have a very distributed team. We have folks in Kansas City and New York and LA and all over the country. And also, we essentially have two types of staff. We have people that work the shows, the production type people, and then you have the people that support them, either from sales, operations, HR, et cetera. And so it's natural for them to be some rivalry and uh, friction between those two teams. And that friction was actually very toxic for us about 10 years ago at one point. It got to a really ugly place. And I never want to let that happen again. And so bringing everybody out together to even just to sit down, eat and drink. And, you know, we did some of the kind of traditional stuff. We played disc golf and we did like some ropes course stuff, but it was mainly just, you know, get everybody in each other's presence for a while, even if it's like three day vacation or whatever. That's, that was huge. Um, another thing for me was that we, we brought in, um, there's a relationship counselor who she's just an amazing woman who helped my former business partner and I get through some of our tougher moments. She's helped my wife and I helped get, get through some tougher moments. So I asked her to help me with some of my staff who were butting heads with each other to help them find their, their personal truth, to speak their personal truth to one another in a safe space. And it really helped those folks get over the hump. Again, personalities being who they are, people, human beings being who they are, they're not always going to get along all the time. And you may end up working with somebody that you just don't like, right? But you have to find a way to work together. You have to find a way because you're trying to accomplish this mission. If you don't like it enough, you're free to leave, of course. But like, we found a way to do that. And we have people, I've been through so much of my life, so many struggles, so many personal, like, hoops I had to jump through and speed bumps I had to get over that I sometimes see folks in my, in my, on my team, in my family that I'm never afraid to share those experiences to try to help those people evolve. And I will say another thing I'm proud of, like I think about every single one of them has just grown so much in the time they've been working with us, you know, not just as business people, not just in their work, but like I think about the personal growth, the work that these people have done, um, it's really impressive. I'm, you know? I'm interested, Robbie, if you yeah. have, a, what's your belief or, or any, I don't know, what, how do you view the relationship between personal growth and performance, whether it's at an individual level or, or collectively for the, like how the business is doing, 
Do you see any sort of correlation between growth and, and performance? I, I absolutely, yeah. I think, um, you know, we're a society of people with like uneven parenting. I think we're, you know, we're a, a society of children of divorced parents. And, you know, there's, there's a, and especially in the event industry, a lot of the folks in the event industry aren't just there because they're there because it was, they're, we're the outcasts and the miscreants and the, the we're a, the island of misfit toys. You guys the, are on the fringe. You're yeah, out. we're absolute. We were always like, it's the, it was always like the, the goth kids and the punks and the, and so the people I've hired are people that like, I was, by the way, always looking for waiters, bartenders, uh, uh, caterers, because those are people know how to make money a dollar at a time by making people smile. You mm -hmm. want to teach customer service, go to work, or you want to learn customer service, go to work in a restaurant for a year, you know, and then come to work for me. But, you know, we have a lot of folks who've, who've had their struggles and that's, the nature of this industry. It's not a bunch of people who went to Harvard and Yale and, you know, did top, finished tops in their class. These are people who had to hustle for every last inch. And so sometimes it's hard to get those people out of that kind of competitive mindset and into a more of a team aesthetic, right? And, um, and so sometimes the, the best way, I've found like the best way to learn how to overcome your own demons is to read biographies of other people who've gone through them. So I share my personal demons with people as a way of helping them see, first of all, that it's okay to share and be vulnerable with each other, but also um, that it's okay to like struggle, right? Yeah. It's, I've all, my dad used to tell me that like on your worst day, the people that are there for you are the people you want to keep by you, right? So when I'm seeing my staff on their worst days, I'm going to absolutely make sure I'm there for them. Not as their boss, but like, what can I do? What do you need? I'm here. You know, I'm just checking in on you, like, whatever it is. And and so, um, a lot of them have stayed a lot longer than probably than their you know their profit driving motive would indicate. For that reason, they know they're in a safe place. You know, they know we've got their back. And and likewise. And and it sounds like that personal growth is part of the equation. Like they're. They're seeing you value them as people, and as they're learning and growing and developing on their their path in life, yeah, you know, you're you're there along the way, supporting and encouraging that. You're, it sounds like you're modeling that even. Let me be vulnerable with all of you about my weaknesses, my trouble spots, and what I'm doing to overcome that. I was yeah. I was fascinated that you brought in a relationship person that not only helped you and your partner, but you and your spouse, and then. And then you brought her in to help with some some team member relationship. Like this isn't just about dollars and cents. And here's what I hired you to do. And it sounds like this is about you as a person and you can be a real human and we're going to support and bring you into what we're doing. You're an important part of us. And that's quite a message you've sent. Well, so much of what you hear about business is, is you know, increase profit, reduce cost and reduce friction in efficiency. What is interpersonal friction? What does that cost your company? Mm -hmm. What is that inefficiency? What is that one person who just doesn't like this other person or can't work with them? How much time is wasted in, in inefficiency in those things? And if you can get those two people into a place where they can at least, okay, I hear you. God, you're right. That was dumb. I'll try to do it differently next time from like, well, you did this, you did that. You're supposed to do it this way. You're supposed, if you can get them to a place where they're at least empathetic with one another, it makes everything work better. It makes everybody want to come to work and work together. And like I said, this is not Shangri-La and it's not Kumbaya. We're still some salty old music industry types. We still make fun of each other. And I'm sure there, you know, the folks in my company are going to listen to this and laugh, laugh at some of it too, but that's part of what we encourage. Like it's part of the game. Like if you can't, if you can't have a sense of humor about this stuff either, you're, you're missing the point. Yeah. Well, I, from the, from the retreat to the relationship thing, to yeah. supporting them in, in some of their own personal things and, and showing by example that we can be vulnerable and here's what, I, you know, here's what's helped me. And we can share with each other all of those things just 
speak to the humanness, right? Our humanity. And it sounds like instead of just moving around a bunch of dollars and cents and pieces and parts and ins and outs that you, you've learned how to create a place where people matter and we're going to come together in, in our imperfectness, but we're going to, we're going to work with and support each other and we'll do it together. It also feeds into us being a better business also though, because when you consider the specifics of what we are doing, we are renting our, for instance, we rent headphones to a person who's putting on a, a backyard party or a concert or a festival, right? We have to know how to speak to those people with respect and kindness and explain what it is they're doing. We get calls from moms who are, you know, I need headphones for my son's bar mitzvah or I need headphones for my daughter's wedding. And like, there's no degree of patience that is enough for these folks to get through those calls, mm -hmm. but we have to find it. And so if you're not having that sort of service, it is all about service, right? It's service to one another in the company, service to our clients, service to our fans, the people who come to our shows. I used to think there's this, I, this thing that came out of our work in the music industry there's a part of our culture that believes that like the VIPs um, shouldn't, you know, people who, have, who are rich shouldn't have to buy tickets. I feel if somebody's nice enough to buy a ticket to my concert, I'm going to treat them like gold. Right. Like the, the actual ticket buyers were the people I wanted to take care of. And, and so that aspect of service goes into everything we do. In the corporate and conference world, it that these high touch events, it's even more pronounced because if you have even one mistake in terms of how you're dealing with somebody at a conference, and that just can't happen. These are people paying three to five to ten thousand dollars to be at a conference on a weekend. If you're you know you're that you're the headphone guru, if you're giving them a hard time or if you're not giving them what they need, you're absolutely not part of the solution. So service has to be a part of every aspect of your of your business in every business. And hiring service industry professionals, I could not encourage it more. It may take longer to teach them how to do that job, that sales job, that operations job, that production job. But what you'll never have to teach them how to do is how to show up on time for one another. And that's sometimes the hardest thing to teach. That's something you can't teach. Can you teach? I don't know. Robbie, I, I, I could go on and on listening to you and talking with you about all sure, the things sorry. that you've done uh we we need to wrap up but i before i ask you to share like how people can get a, a hold of you i just want to comment uh usually when i have these conversations i you know i have to talk to to the guest about well what are some of the, you know I, i'm we may talk about the purpose of their business or some of their values but whether or not we do it, it doesn't always come out and and for you i think most of our listeners could just rattle off a few of the things that you've just mentioned naturally again and again right service being one of them humility growth or learning like even if you don't have those things formally written on a document or on a website or on a wall you. i'm sure you, you do. yes so I'm sure right you do. on a whiteboard that we never erase yeah but even if it weren't there it's so present in everything you're talking about that you've been able to build a team and by extension an experience with your partners your clients that you know the attendees everybody who interacts with you comes comes to know who you are as a group of people you do you truly have a shared identity and so i congratulate you for that thank you for sharing your experience and insights with us today robbie will you let people know if they want to learn more about hush concerts it's a fascinating idea and what the services you provide are are incredibly unique and i think awesome tell guests how to how to learn about hush concerts and or how to connect with you whatever you want to share there sure i mean everything everything we do is uh through uh, hushconcerts.com our website you can reach out to me directly if you need to robbie at hushconcerts um all the silent conference stuff works through that as well so if you have a business you're looking at uh do you want to do um, one of your talks in your building or outside your building instead of going to a conference center or whatever? We can help you with that. Or if you just want to rent headphones for your daughter's wedding or whatever, reach out to us there. Um, everything is through Hush Concerts at Hush Concerts on uh, social. Very good. Well, Robbie, it's been our pleasure to have you here on the show today. Thank you again for being our guest. It's an honor. Thank you so much. 
All right. For all of you listening, please continue to share this podcast with others. There are many seven-figure business owners out there who are trying to figure out the lessons that will help them move their business forward. We have great guests like Robbie every single episode. Please share, like, do all those things so we can help as many of them as possible. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast with your host, Brett Gillerland. Be sure to leave a rating and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. You may also want to visit our website, EliteEntrepreneursPodcast.com, to find additional resources to grow your business from seven figures to 10 million and beyond.